Welcome to part two of the low voltage regen video series. Now uh, you might notice I picked the Armstrong circuit rather than the tapped coil Hartley style regen. Really you can use either one. Um, in the broadcast band it's especially forgiving. Um, we're going to go with the old school Armstrong approach on this receiver. And as you can see I've started to do a little bit of wiring. Um, Let's, let's figure out some of the whys and hows of wiring. Uh, grounding, that's something that we can go over. A lot of these sets, you build them up quickly and you end up getting uh, funny results. Uh, hum, weird oscillations, it won't go into regeneration at all, all kinds of things happen. A lot of that can be traced back to your wiring practice, so we're going to go through some of that. And you might notice we have a front panel on there now. Why do we need a front panel? So this second video is all about the construction and uh, how we make the circuit uh, perform at a high level compared to most of the regens you might have been playing with. So it really doesn't matter what tube you use in these things. It doesn't matter the style of regeneration, whether it's an Armstrong or a Hartley or even a Colpitts type oscillator. They all will work. But we're going to go over this circuit from the standpoint of I've never built a regen before. I don't really know what I'm doing, and I'd like to figure out how to wire this thing and have a successful first project. And uh, you might notice I've lifted up the capacitor off the chassis because uh, I do want to use a front panel with a fairly large knob on the front. And if I mount the capacitor directly down on the wooden baseboard, um, the, the knob is going to be too low. I've also cut out a piece of uh, aluminum that's going to be used as the front panel and uh, that's going to allow stability which is very important it's also going to give me some a metallic shielding between uh, you know the human capacitance of uh, your fingers fooling around in front of a regen uh, can tend to untune it by using a metal uh, front panel. We're uh, going to ground that panel and uh, it's going to eliminate those effects. Now could you use a piece of masonite like uh, from an old clipboard? Absolutely. That would work wonderfully as well but um, it wouldn't give you the shielding effect but it would give you the stability of a front panel. The front panel also allows you to mount things like your regeneration control, your volume control, your headphone jack. Nice to have a headphone jack on the front where you can just plug in your headphones. Of course the main tuning dial. Um, I've just got this pill bottle here representing the coil area. And in the back here your antenna and ground. Over to the right the power input. And I have a representative terminal strip here. I don't know if I'm going to need half that twice that. I might need one or two terminal strips to make the connections. I don't even know yet. I've mounted the two tube sockets in the middle. Um, that allows me to wire out from the middle and it doesn't waste a lot of space uh, because I, I'm experimenting with the reactor with the, uh, with the choke. And uh, I want to try different types of chokes there and see what the performance effects are. See if we can get away with uh, you know, some some junk box uh, chokes. So that's just a, the crazy quick, before we've really drilled any holes or done anything, just want to lay it out in front of yourself and see that everything makes sense before you cut, cut any metal or drill any holes or put any screws into this nice chassis. This is also the time to uh, think about maybe uh, putting a coat of polyurethane on the uh, on the wood if you want to keep the water out of it. Oh, another reason to use a front panel and to even mark the front panel is aesthetically it starts to look better. And that means that it's probably something that you won't be ripping apart too soon. You may even keep it over the long run as an example of your first project. If the first project, however, is very haphazardly built, it doesn't have a front panel and everything's just kind of put on breadboard style. 
it's something you'll probably take apart rather quickly. Okay, here's where uh, here's where some of my 16-year-old uh, enthusiasm rubs off. When you're just starting out building circuits and learning about schematics, it's very easy to not be able to figure out how to lay it out and how to do the wiring. And especially with tube sockets, it's very easy to, for instance, with our miniature socket, flip pin 1 and pin 7 and wire the entire thing backwards. So what I like to do, or what I like to do in the old days, and believe me, my radio is not going to be as pretty as yours because I'm using some some interesting uh, techniques here to try to to show you how to wire it. This helps you to lay out the parts if you just draw it either on a piece of paper or if you're really lazy like I was and in a hurry to actually use a sharpie and draw it right on or a pencil and draw it right on the uh, the wood. And uh, this helps you to not mess up when you start your wiring process. So I just wanted to show you this. And uh, I will sand the top of this down and get rid of all of this. But I did want to at least show you a technique. And uh, it does work. It helps you to figure out how to run your wires and how to lay out your components. So a super boring discussion. How do we wire the radio? What kind of wire are we going to use? Now, of course, you could use uh, wire from old power supply cords. This looks like some black twin lead. This is PVC wire. It's usually number 18 or, or smaller. There's no reason why this wouldn't work uh, to wire a radio like this. It's easy to strip. Yeah, you just strip it and nice copper under there. Certainly that would work okay. The old brown rubber lamp cord. Yeah. Uh, here's some number 14 house wire. That's going to make for some stiff wiring. Um, that looks like it's uh, maybe number 18 PVC wire. So you can go that route. Use a scavenged wire from old cords. Um, a step up from that perhaps is PVC type wire. Uh, PVC wire, uh, inexpensive. You find it all over appliances and so on. Uh, you know, it comes in many colors. Uh, the kind of wire I like to use uh, because uh, it's very forgiving with soldering is uh, FEP um, or PTFE Teflon wire. Now, Teflon wire is interesting because uh, it strips very nicely, comes in many colors, and uh, when you solder it, it doesn't discolor, shrink back, it just stays put. And I've got a bunch of different colors. And uh, that, that wire works very well. Speaking of colors, let's talk about color codes. Uh, one thing that can help a beginner uh, when you're building your first radios is to use a color code on your wires. Buy a little bit of different colors. Some people like to use red for the, the high voltage or the, uh, the plate voltage or the collector voltage on transistor circuits. Red. Um, I've seen orange used as a kind of the medium high voltage. Uh, yellow or white uh, is used for the filament circuits and a lot of tube type uh, construction articles. And for your general wiring, people like to use brown wire or gray wire. And uh, of course, ground is always going to be some kind of a black wire. So you might as well get yourself a spool of black wire. This is number 20. That's a good size for, uh, for wiring tube circuits. 20 is a little heavy. Maybe 22 might be a better choice. Uh, 22 uh, Teflon wire is, is really nice for wiring radio circuits. Now, uh, some radio circuits are more sensitive than others. One of the more sensitive parts of the radio circuit is 
the volume control of your audio amplifier. So here we are, here's our volume control, uh, especially a high impedance type control, like a one meg potentiometer uh, with an audio taper. That means it's not a linear potentiometer, it's an audio taper. That taper is logarithmic and it's very pleasing as you turn up the volume, it comes up the way you'd expect it. This is a one meg pot, I can see on the back it's marked. Notice how I've taken the wires and twisted them. I've twisted the ground, the tap, which is the volume controlled tap, and the hot side, which is where the audio comes in full blast. And as you turn it, the volume will go up as it's wired here. Ground, tap, and then hot. If you can't afford it, uh, you really should use shielded wire on potentiometers. And here's an example of a shielded wire. It's got a, a braid and two leads. So you put the braid on the ground. You could use the black one for the center and the uh, white for the hot. But uh, a nice shielded cable for your highly sensitive audio line to reduce hum. You can make your own. If you can get a hold of some braid, you can uh, squeeze the braid and then shuck some wires underneath it. And this will make a homemade shielded cable for your volume control pot. The regeneration uh, control is not as sensitive. It's a DC voltage in this circuit, but it would not hurt to also twist the wires coming off the regeneration pot. So uh, let's take a little further here. The tube sockets. Um, once these tube sockets are on your board and mounted, you're going to find it very difficult to know where pin 1 and pin 7 is. And you're going to find it very difficult to solder to those sockets. So here's an idea. Pre-wire them. Uh, go as far as to put the, uh, the grid leak capacitor and resistor on there. Any other small resistors and capacitors. Have them hanging off these sockets before you actually put them on the breadboard. So that's, that's a trick for uh, beginners especially. So you don't miswire the tube sockets. Also, once you have them mounted, the standoffs get in the way of good soldering practice. And uh, I think this pre-wiring exercise uh, will promote good soldering. Depending on the variable capacitor that you get your hands on, there's usually three tapped holes in the front of the variable, and you can attach the variable any place on your front panel using those three screws. This also grounds the rotor of the capacitor. The rotor is actually the grounded part. The stator in here is the hot part. Okay, the rotor is grounded. The stator is hot. Uh, so those screws will ground the frame of the capacitor to the front panel. In my case, I did not have any way to attach the capacitor to the panel, so I had to drill a little hole and tap it to give me a solid connection to the front panel. That's both for mechanical stability as well as electrical stability. And then I just have a couple of legs that hold the uh, capacitor to the bottom. With the three uh, screw system on most of these variables, you wouldn't need to have something to support the bottom. So there we are. We have a solidly uh, mounted variable capacitor for our main tuning. So we have our two controls mounted. We have on the, uh, the left the uh, volume control marked uh, 1 meg. And on the right we have the regeneration control, which is anything really between a 10k and a 50k potentiometer. We can work on that a little later to see uh, if we need to uh, spread that out a little bit by putting a series resistor in there to uh, make the regeneration smoother or we can get away with just the potentiometer but everything's mounted. Also you'll notice down below that I've put a couple of ground points. These are just some solder lugs. Obviously we're using that front panel as our main ground plane for the whole receiver. If we really wanted to be correct we would actually mount the tube sockets 
right on the uh, right on this plate and have the tube sticking out horizontal. And you'll see some older receivers that are built that way just for this purpose to uh, to get good grounding and to get uh, a little bit closer to the controls and so on. But we're going to be mounting our tube sockets as you can see where those holes are uh, right in the center of the board. So let's start to mount some of those uh, larger parts onto the chassis. So I got one uh, 12 AV6 installed. I need another one. I found this one in the box. It doesn't look too good, does it? <laughs> I think this uh, lived with uh, in a bad place for a long time. So we'll try to bring this one back and that'll be our, our second 12 AV6. These are untested tubes. We've done some wiring. You can see I've run the uh, black wires. These represent the ground connections. And the yellow wire represents uh, the filament on the tubes. And uh, as a first test, I've put in a couple of 12 AV6s. They're untested tubes, but I'm not going to worry too much about that to start with. Let's put the meter in the ohm scale, and let's just see. There's nothing connected but the filaments at this point. See if we uh, can uh, measure some resistance of the two tubes in series. And I've got 25 ohms. So if we have 24 volts and we have 25 ohms, it's going to be just under an amp draw. Now, as the tubes warm up, the resistance will go up of the tubes and the current will go down. So just because you've got 24 volts, uh, or 24 volts and 25 ohms doesn't mean that you're drawing an amp to light up those tubes. Next, we want to check the power supply. See what we got for voltage. Hopefully, we've got 24 volts here. Let's take a look. Close enough, 23.95. Okay. So, I'm going to hook up the ground. And I'm going to Put the meter in the amps position. I don't know, amps, milliamps, whatever. Put it in amps. And we're going to put the positive of the meter on the positive of the, uh, the source. We're going to put the negative of the meter right on the positive input and look look at that current go down. It's down to 0.153. So maybe initially it started out at almost an amp, but it sure didn't take very long for the current to be reduced to 150 milliamps. Let's just make sure that the tubes are actually lit up. See if we can see anything. Kind of hard to see. Let's go down in there. See if we can see those tubes lit up. Oh yes, you can see them. They are both lit up. So there you go. That was our first connection. We're checking the continuity of the filament circuit and the tubes are lighting up with 24 volts. So let's take this simple grounding example where we're just hooking up the filament circuit to the 24 volts. Current goes through the two tubes and back out to the return. Now if we do the complete grounding on the system, there's really not that many wires required. We're using the front panel as a ground, so we just get the pots grounded to that. Grounding the frame of the reactor just for good practice. And looks like we're grounding the filament and the cathode both uh, right back to the 24 volt minus. This is going to work probably for this circuit without much trouble. But we have to remember we've got three circuits on this board. We have the filaments, the audio amplifier stage and the RF stage. And we really would like to keep all of those circuits away from each other to minimize unwanted coupling, noise, and so on. So there's a system called star grounding, which is a little more advanced. What we're doing is making sure that we've separated the filament return from the return that we're using for all the other circuits, which is really based on that front panel ground plane. The star ground is a little more sophisticated 
it actually is counterintuitive that longer wires could act as better grounds than shorter wires that are daisy chained. But this star grounding system is one way to reduce unwanted pickup and hum in some of these simple receivers. So I'm taking my time on this uh, video series so I can make sure that everybody uh, catches up that's actually trying to build the receiver. You remember I mentioned that uh, we could put a phone jack on the front, front panel. Here's an ordinary uh, phone jack. There's one little problem with doing that, however. Our front panel is grounded. So if we put the phone jack right on the front panel and we're passing the DC power through it, there's going to be a short circuit. Um, that's another reason a lot of people like to use a transformer on the output of a receiver that isolates you from the power supply and now you can use a grounded jack. The alternative is to use something called a shoulder washer which insulates the jack both the uh, the outer part and the the part that takes the tip so the tip and the ring are both isolated from the front panel if we use a shoulder washer. Um, so. I'll see if uh, it's worth doing that much work. If not, I'll just put a couple of the Fostock clips uh, on the side and we'll clip in our headphones just like we do on a lot of other crystal radio type circuits. Also, uh, before we end this video, um, I wanted to show you this receiver over here. This is, in fact, a regenerative broadcast band receiver. And uh, this is from the early 20s and it uses the popular O1A triode tubes. It's one stage of regenerative and two audio amplifier stages. So regenerative receivers were quite popular in the 20s and very practical for the broadcast band. So in the next video we're going to get down and dirty on the final wiring and we're going to get into the coil and how to wind the coil for the receiver.